Look, I welcome everybody to the Australian Naval Institute's webinar on the recent announcement of the Service Combatant Fleet Review. Um, I'm Jen Parker. For those of you that don't know me, I'm a counsellor with the Australian Naval Institute. Uh, and the Australian Naval Institute is a non-profit self-supporting organisation that encourages the promotion and advancement of knowledge related to the maritime profession. Uh, it's important to note that we are not uh, part of the Department of Defence or sponsored by government in any way. I do wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which I'm coming to you from, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and recognise any other people or families with connection to the lands of the ACT in the region. I wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and this region. I also acknowledge the service of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and all veterans who have served their nation on the sea. Uh, as you can see on the screen, we have a little bit of housekeeping to go through before we uh, really kick off. Uh, we've got over 100 people registered for this event, which is fantastic. Uh, it does mean that all of your microphones have been muted. Um, and I guess uh, we're asking, can you please leave them on mute unless you've been asked to speak? Uh, this will help keep the background noise now, noise down and improve the quality of the sound. Uh, the event is being recorded and will be available post the event. Uh, questions, if you have a question to ask, please move your cursor to the bottom of the screen. This will open a bar the bottom of the screen with a chat function. If you can type your question in the chat function, uh, identifying who you are, if you have a pseudonym uh, on your Zoom login, uh, we will get to questions later in the webinar. So um, I am very pleased to be joined by three incredibly esteemed panelists who have donated their time today to discussing this important issue. Um, most of them are probably familiar to you, but I will go through some uh, brief bios. So uh, first we have Vice Admiral Peter Jones. Uh, Peter joined the Royal Australian Navy in 1974 uh, and he was promoted to the rank of Vice Admiral and appointed to the position of Chief Capability Development Group in late 2011. And was advanced to the Officer of the Order of Australia in the 2012 Queen's Birthday Honours List. Peter is an adjunct fellow in the Naval Studies Group at the University of New South Wales and was the President of the Australian Naval Institute from 2015 to 2023. Uh, of course, Peter has vast experience, and those of you that are familiar would know and have tracked his career with multiple commands. We're very pleased to have Peter uh, with us. Uh, we also have Sarah Pavillard. Sarah has 25 years of defence experience working both as a naval officer and as a consultant. She's the Adroita founder and CEO. Sarah was also instrumental in developing, integrating and supporting some of the most complex materials in service today, such as the $10 billion air warfare destroyer capability, in 2021, she was recognised as Consultant of the Year at the Defence Industry Awards for her work on the Story Program. Thanks for joining us, Sarah. Uh, and then our final speaker, uh, Dr. Richard Dunley, is a Senior Lecturer at UNSW Canberra at the Australian Defence Force Academy. He's also prolific on Twitter, I might add, so uh, please follow him if you're into that sort of thing. Uh, his research and teaching addresses issues across naval history and maritime strategy. A uh, particular focus has been on interactions of naval technology and maritime strategy, both historical and contemporary contexts. So the perfect person to have on today. So look, just briefly, uh, for those of you that are coming at this fairly cold, um, the Surface Combatant Fleet Review announcement was announced on the 20th of February. Uh, we will have our speakers going to this in more depth. But broadly, uh, you will have seen the headlines. It announced the enhancement of the service combatant fleet with figures up to 26 uh, over a significant period of time. Now, that included uh, the six hunter-class frigates, the reduction of the hunter-class program from nine to six, the uh, surprise announcement to many of the 11 new general purpose frigates to replace the Anzac-class frigates, the acquisition of six large optionally crewed surface vessels, and a statement that 25 minor war vessels was the number we needed, therefore reducing the Arafira offshore patrol vessel to six. Now, there was much more to it than that, uh, and I will let our speakers get into that. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Dr. Richard Dunley uh, to take the stage and uh, talk about the genesis of the Service Combatant Fleet Review. Now, for those of you online, um, please type your questions in the chat as we go. About halfway through the webinar, we will turn to those questions. Richard. Thanks, Jen. Um, I'm going to got a few minutes, and so I'm briefly going to talk about three kind of things. Where, where does this come from? What's the the kind of the background? Um, talk a little bit about some of the, the, the main aims as I see them, um, and then I will use my um, 
the, the my moment on the stage to, to flag two issues which we might want to then pull up a bit more in in the questions um so where does this come from well i think realistically you can sort of see uh go back to, to 2009 uh, roughly um and the plans to kind of recapitalize the ren surface fleet um, which are set out sort of first quite relatively clearly, at least in the 2009 Defence White Paper, um, the idea of eight future frigates um, and a new class of OCVs, ocean combat vessels, um, was was set out, which um, as far as we can tell was sort of um, that there was a, a kind of a, a littoral combat ship uh, aligned at angle, at least elements of that in, in the OCVs. Um, the OCV plan gets dropped relatively quickly um, and they become more more standard um, offshore patrol vessels, OPVs, um, which is what then becomes the, the Arafura class. Um, it all seems a little bit like ancient history, um, but I think it, it is important to, to flag that because I think one of the things that's that's sort of the key issues and drivers here is, is around timeline. Um, the time frame over that period uh, has consistently slipped um, and you've seen both sort of both political parties trying to blame the other for this. Um, and I think you can probably say that um, honours are about even um, and that they're probably both uh, responsible in, in one way or another for, for issues around this. Um, but it's clear that uh, if you look at some of the, the documents coming out in 2011-12 around when these kind of capabilities should be hitting the water, um, that the dates now, uh, some of them are already in the past um, and, and we still look like we're a long way from, from getting uh, these kind of capabilities. Um, so obviously the frigate program eventually shifts to nine um, and becomes the, the hunter and the OPV program uh, get morphs and, and becomes uh, the, the Arafura class. Um, in both cases, there have been issues with the build um, and we're not going to, I don't think, get hugely into the, the varying questions over hunter, good, bad, and, and the issues with the OPVs. Um, but I think it is important to understand that these programs have not been running swimmingly, and that is another issue within um, that's been driving the, the need for this review. Um, but I think the biggest problem here um, or, or issue that's come up is the fact that the world's changed. Uh, since 2009, we look like we're in a, a very different kind of place. Uh, added into that mix, of course, is AUKUS. Um, one of the things I think that, that remains somewhat open for discussion is exactly what it is when um, uh, Rich Miles talks about the need to, to reorientate uh, the surface combatant force uh, around AUKUS. Um, and I think there, there's more questions that can be pulled out there, um, but it certainly it drives pressure for, for, for further change. Um, and to a degree, certainly in terms of the surface force, this provides the context for, for the DSR, um, which is the, the kind of driving force behind um, the, the surface fleet review. So I think um, we might get a bit more touching on the, the DSR in a minute, but um, the DSR, the Defence Strategic Review, very much highlights that the maritime nature of Australia's strategic challenge um, and therefore the importance of developing naval capability. Um, now, in something of a surprise, certainly to me, uh, and I think to, to most other people, the DSR did not itself make any recommendations and instead recommended a further review, um, which, uh, again, in terms of timeline issues, uh, can cause uh, is, is potentially for a factor in this further problem. Um, and this is where the um, the surface combatant fleet review comes from, um, which was handed to government at the end of last year. Um, and it appears that there has been lots of, of backroom wrangling since then over exactly what the government response should be to the surface fleet review. Um, but that is the... Um, uh, that is the frame through which we we get to to sort of look at, at the surface uh, fleet review. Um, briefly to talk about uh, a couple of things which then I think fall out from understanding that. Um, so what is it that the surface fleet review was, was there to try and achieve? Um, I think you can pull out three things. Um, the first of these is that dragged out kind of time frame to replace the existing combatants, particularly the, the ANZAC class, um, means that we need stuff fast. Um, and the speed element of this is a crucial factor in, in driving a lot of the decision making. Um, the second element is that the DSR highlights very much the increased dangers um, and the need for more capable vessels. Um, we've adopted seemingly the American um, language here, in an enhanced lethality. Um, I can't say I'm a huge fan, but um, maybe that's, that's my pommy roots coming out. Um, so we need vessels faster. They need to be 
of enhanced lethality, and they need to be more of them. Um, a greater number of vessels, a recognition that the current fleet is effectively too small. Um, there are also hints, um, both in the DSR and in some of the defense minister's statements, um, around ideas of some of the American ideas of distributed lethality um, and the, the degree to which we need to, to spread out, um, particularly things like missile um, uh, fit out because of uh, the risk of putting too much, too many of your eggs into, into one basket, as it were. Um, but I think this is important because you've got to understand what it is the surface fleet review is trying to achieve, which is basically it's trying to get more and more capable vessels faster. Um, and when you look at it in that respect, this becomes quite obvious why this is um, such a significant challenge. Um, and I'll use my last uh, moments or so to, to flag three, two issues that I think are, are worth highlighting, one of which is what, uh, something I know I've discussed with Jen. Um, that's the fact that this is the surface combatants fleet review. Um, so what about all the rest of the picture? Uh, so one of the things that immediately came to mind for me was what about um, MCM, mine countermeasures, hydrographic survey, um, even stuff like if you dramatically increase the size of the fleet, um, what about the replenishment facilities? Uh, having two AORs um, doesn't seem like that's going to be uh, sort of fit for purpose. The other side that I would throw in there is, is the question of focus versus balance fleet. The DSR has very much taken a view on this, um, but we are still almost certainly going to be required to be doing humanitarian aid and disaster relief, doing lots of constabulary duties. If we are cutting back on things like the Arafuras, which are very much focused on that, um, what does that mean? Um, and I think more broadly, what is um, what are the implications of the, the kind of wider shift that this seems to be symbolizing in what the Navy is there to do? Um, I will leave it there um, and I look forward to questions. Thanks, Richard. Uh, some fantastic points there. And we're seeing lots of questions coming in the chat. That's great. Please keep the questions coming. Uh, and I'll ask Sarah to offer a few opening remarks. Thanks very much, Jen. I'm just going to share my screen because I've put together a few slides. So just bear with me as I bring that up. Okay, just confirming the slides have come up. Fantastic. Okay, great. So this is really, um, I did a webinar last week um, from an Adroita perspective. So this is a consolidation of a couple of the key slides. Um, so I think before we can really fully understand the outcomes of the enhanced lethality service combatant fleet review, it's really important to understand the framework that got us here. And starting with, I guess, the, the top six priorities that were called out in the defense strategic review last year. And I think the two that really link to the um, service combatant fleet review are the priority to invest in conventionally armed nuclear powered submarines and to develop ADF's long range strike capability, including um, local manufacture. So what was the exam question? I think um, there's been a lot of uh, discussion, even in the lead up to the announcements about what would be covered. You know, Richard just touched on a few of the points about um, the amphibious ships, mine countermeasures, but, Again, in order to understand the recommendations, it's it's really key to understand what was actually called for. One of the key DSR recommendations was that a independent analysis of Navy's service combatant fleet capability be conducted in quarter three, 2023, to ensure its size, structure, and composition complement the capabilities provided by the forthcoming conventionally armed nuclear powered submarines. So I think it's very important that um, we have a collective understanding that this review was framed in the context of Australia now being on this path to acquire nuclear powered submarines. And there were some key subordinate elements that the uh, review needed to cover as well. So the capability requirements to meet our current strategic circumstances as outlined in the review and the cost schedule risks and the continuous shipbuilding uh, potential of each option. So I'll just touch very briefly on size, structure and composition. Um, so as recommended by the Defence Strategic Review, um, for the tier one service combatants, 
Uh, we will continue to operate the Hobart class destroyers, three of them, uh, with an accelerated um, schedule for conducting the destroyer capability enhancement and the Aegis Baseline 9 upgrade. Uh, Hunter class frigates have been reduced from nine to six uh, with build to continue in Adelaide. But I think there's an unspoken element here and the review also called for an accelerated consideration for the acquisition of the next destroyer. So my, my gut is to watch this space in terms of the Type 26 hull and what that future capability could be. And though that, that pro program will be starting in the next couple of years. Um, of course, there was um, a, a surprise announcement for many. There's six new large optionally crewed surface vessels, um, significantly increasing the strike capability. Um, and I touch on the future destroyer class. The tier two um, are the 11 uh, general purpose frigate, frigates. The, the, the review actually recommended between, I think it was seven and 11. Government has now committed to acquiring 11 and the first three will be off the shelf uh, to an existing design out of a shipyard that is currently producing um, that design with the remainder to be built in Western Australia and six ANZACs uh, to remain in service without conducting the transition capability assurance program. So two to be retired as quickly as possible and the other ships to be retired at the, the end of their um forecast life and then um uh, in the mix are the min minor war vessels 25 minor war vessels including the offshore six offshore patrol vessels it's important to note that this actually encompasses um some vessels to potentially be acquired by australian border force as well to get some standardized capabilities and i suspect sustainment concepts operating um, so I just think uh, before I jump into the continuous shipbuilding piece, so we know what's coming, but I think it's just important to remind us what we're not getting as well. So um, again, ANZAC's retired um, aligned with their, their uh, plan withdrawal dates, their original plan withdrawal dates. So the life of type extension will not occur, um, but lethality upgrades will still be necessary um, for these vessels. Uh, a reduction in the offshore patrol vessel build from 12 to 6. I understand that will give another five years of ship build capability in WA in terms of those OPVs. But the big question mark I have is what is intended to occur now for C1905, uh, which was reliant on those hulls. And then, of course, the change um, in the, the number of Hunter class frigates being acquired. In terms of the shipbuilding context, continuous shipbuilding context, Hunter class frigate construction will commence this year as planned and build through to 2043, uh, followed by an accelerated kickoff of the DD, the future DDG. Is it a replacement? Uh, what's the concept? We don't know yet, but it's flagged the need to accelerate um, consideration about future DDGs. Um, there's a recommitment to continuous shipbuilding in the West. And I think this is the really complex element of what's called out in the surface um, enhanced lethality service combatant fleet review outcomes. It's a big mouthful. Um, so not only are the Evolve Cape class going to continue to be built in WA, there's a huge program of work for Army watercraft, including some very large vessels. There'll be the need uh, for a steel hull shipyard for the eight generous general purpose frigates, as well as the capability to build the large optionally crewed surface vessels. Now, this is also happening in conjunction with a consolidation to the Henderson shipyard that was called out in the defense strategic review and preparation for the region to uh, sustain nuclear powered submarines, including from as early as 2027 to support the um, US and UK rotational forces. Um, the other little gem I thought that came out of the uh, service combatant review was the recommendation for an annual shipbuilding schedule to be released and government's acceptance that a biannual shipbuilding schedule will be released. This will really improve certainty and the planning horizon for industry, I believe. Um, in terms of cost schedule workforce, so some of the key figures that have been floated is an, an additional 
$1.7 billion over the forward estimate, so the next four years, to enhance the um, surface combatant capability, an additional $11.1 billion of additional funding over the next 10 years has already been agreed by the Expenditure Review Committee of Government. Um, there are two sort of figures that were um, released in the minister's press release about this, $38 billion expected to be in invested in the enhanced lethality surface combatant fleet over the next decade. Um, but an, a, another figure was um, shared of $54.2 billion. So I suspect that rolls in sustainment elements, but it's not quite clear. And we might get some more insight into that with the annual budget in May. Um, I have some concerns about sustainment estimates and the impact to support systems um, for buying a MOTS vessel that might come up in the questions. In terms of um, schedule, the, the dance card is very, very full um, for this agenda and um, workforce is going to require a significant scale up and I suspect will be most challenged in WA. And that workforce piece is in light of a broader demand across Australia for a jump up of 640,000 tech workers by 2030. So we're not the only um, national programs that um, are demanding the kind of workforce that's going to be necessary for shipbuilding. And then very briefly, I just want to touch on the Sovereign Defence Industry Development Strategy, DIDS, that was released about a week after or two weeks after the um, service combatant review outcomes. Um, so I think the first really critical point is the bigger agenda across all of defence industry to integrate into a trilateral industrial base. So the first step necessary is to really nationalise the Australian defence industrial base. There were four priorities, um, sovereign defence industry priorities that I think are relevant. And they are, of course, continuous shipbuilding sustainment. And there's some key inclusions on the slide. Uh, the guided weapons piece as a key input into the integration requirements. The development of autonomous systems. And so this touches on the um, LOS fee and then test evaluation, certification and system assurance. Um, I think there are a lot of, I, I think the DIDS raises as many questions as it answers, uh, particularly around sovereign capability. And I think that in some ways it's a vote of no confidence in the Australian industry, but I'm really interested in what questions um, might come up during today's discussion. And at that, I'll wrap up. Wonderful. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, very comprehensive in, uh, overview. And we're getting some, some great questions in the chat now, some of which you, you've just touched on, but I'm sure there will be some about DIDS. Uh, Vice Admiral Jones, I'll hand over to you now. Uh, thanks, Jen, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, Jen asked me to look at what were the essential ingredients for a successful and sustainable shipbuilding industry in Australia. Um, the short answer is there's probably six ingredients, but before I get on to the six, I should just, um, following on from what Richard and Sarah have said, I've gone back and looked at how often have we been in the situation where we're coming up with a revised plan for what the future surface combatant fleet should look like? Um, and uh, by my count, since the, the, um, the fleet unit arrived in Sydney Harbour in 1913, um, we've done this um, on 12 occasions. So this is the, the 12th time we've done a, a reset on our future uh, fleet composition. Um, and uh, probably the two things that stand out about this particular one, one is, as Richard uh, um, indicated, it's um, it's driven a lot by the change strategic situation um, and with a view that having a, a predominant fleet composed of hunters and arrow viewers was not suitable for the changing strategic environment, but that these ships, but not in as many numbers, still had an operational value. Um, the second one was, although in the media there's been a lot of um, 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 discussion about where's all the detail to the program, but when you look at uh, some of the previous um, adjustments we've done to the fleet composition, this plan is um, is actually much more detailed and much more expansive than than um, very many be beforehand. Um, 
But to to answer that uh, exam question about what makes a successful um, Australian shipbuilding, I think it's uh, we, we've got a couple of unique uh, factors in Australia, which are, are well worth talking about. Um, I notice in the uh, in the in all the participants in today's webinar, there's some uh, long-time members of the Australian Naval Institute and former Chiefs of Navy. And uh, you may recall uh, uh, before the Headmark Journal, the Naval Institute used to put out, we used to put out the, the journal of the ANI. And, and, in, um, and in that, there used to be a section called Illumination Rounds. And uh, in 1999, I wrote an article when I was uh, um, captain of Melbourne, um, talking about one of the uh, the issues the fleet in 1999 faced, and that was that essentially we were building and sustaining a very heterogeneous fleet, and and at that time we had sh ships either designed and or built from Australia, US, UK, Italy, Germany, Sweden, and France. And as a medium power Navy at that time, we were a bit of an outlier in not having our own design capability. And we'd essentially lost that in the late seventies, early eighties, we canceled the, the DDL program on the basis that it was too big only to buy the FFGs, which were about the same size. Um, we scrapped the protector on, on the, um, the fleet replenishment ship on the stocks at Cockatoo Island um, for a proven design and then that was plagued with so many problems and cost overruns. We never got to build the uh, the second ship. And, and in fact, that, that long-term aim of having two replenishment ships of the same design, it took us you know decades to realize that, that dream. Um, in 1999, we had over 20 different diesel generators in the fleet, a, do a dozen different nav radars, multiple different um, damage control methodologies and a diverse array of systems that put a premium on sustainment and meant we needed more uniformed personnel than you would need because of that fragmentation that, that had to happen with the technical workforce and the increasing training load. Now, um, so I've sort of raised all this because that's pretty much where we still are today. And, th and so that puts a, um, a complexity on our situation, but also when we look forward um, with a, a nuclear submarine program um, and uh, shortages in recruitment and, and, um, and industry and finding skilled people, um, that desire for commonality and, um, and to evolve designs, I think is still there. So I'm going to uh, just try and share my screen now. Um, and just, just bear with me. So, um, so you can see there, what I believe the key ingredients are, you need to have a long-term predictable program of work. And, um, and that allows um, industry to um, be able to, to plan and be efficient. And it's interesting going back to the papers in even in 1950 that went to cabinet to the Menzies government. And the key factor that, um, that the Department of Industry took to, uh, to the Menzies government was their, their um, analysis and talking to industry was if you can have a predictable program with no gaps in in uh, shipbuilding then they uh, they don't have to uh, recruit and retrain uh, people and that is the most efficient way in those days we were still building merchant ships and so it, it applied to them as well so having that long-term predictable program and so I think uh, one positive is that both sides of government are talking about a continuous shipbuilding industry. Um, high prob probability, uh, high priority on system commonality and evolving designs. So I think if, um, and this isn't having a go at the the Hunter um, uh, and BAE team, um, but if if we had just continued to evolve the Hobart class, um, uh, we wouldn't be having this webinar today. Um, uh, and don't be afraid to modify ships. Um, James Goldrick, uh, when he was doing his presentations on um, on shipbuilding and the history of it, he um, he demonstrated that uh, actually, uh, with a very few exceptions, we, we've had uh, a pretty good track record of evolving designs 
to meet our requirements where, where it made sense. But as I've indicated there, you need to carefully do it. Um, it's interesting at the moment where we talk about the general purpose frigate and and the desire for the first three uh, not to be modified. My analysis of those uh, those four contenders, it's probably only the Miko that you um, wouldn't have to modify. The other three, at, in some area, you would have to modify them, and maybe we can uh, talk about that later. Um, Navy must have a sound basis of, of its operational requirements. This may se seem a strange thing, but to, to give an example, um, in the white paper where we said that we wanted uh, an ISW frigate, that just never made sense. It never made sense that um, in a small Navy with a small number of surface combatants and a three-dimensional battle space, you, you were going to say that you want the, the bulk of your fleet to be a specialist ISW frigate. It was just nonsensical. So um, Navy needs to pick up its game in terms of its thinking um, and, and uh, because otherwise you end up in these uh, missteps. Um, the, uh, and we also need to tailor the contract model. So uh, if we're saying we want to standardise things, we're, we've done these, uh, um, these uh, decisions about combat system and so on, um, you, you need to be able to speed up the way that uh, you uh, do your contracting. Um, uh, it, it's been interesting being exposed to the Swedish model for how they do it, where the the, uh, the, the Navy and the contracting people will uh, set out what their basic requirements are. The the contractor uh, will, will come up with a initial design, initial costing, and the government will specify what level of um, profit on each area, depending on risk, uh, that they will attribute, and it is all done with uh, as an open book. Um, but it means that you save years in terms of going through um, RFTs and, and all that sort of thing. So you, in this in this um, time of where time is of the essence and dollars will be on the essence, we need to be much more sophisticated when it comes to contracting. Um, and uh, the final thing is we need to be bipartisan in terms of the sustained commitment for shipbuilding. And when you look at the number of times we've talked about sustainable shipbuilding and local shipbuilding in this country since the 1950s, the uh, where it's tended to fall over is that people have lost the, um, the governments have not committed to it. They've uh, they've been spooked sometimes where the first couple of ships. Um, take longer to build or more expensive. Um, and we saw that with the Hobart, um, you know, the, the difference in uh, efficiency between Hobart and Brisbane was really quite stark. And so you need them to be educated and you need them, uh, both sides government, to be committed to the end state. I'll leave it there, um, Jen. Wonderful, thanks, thanks so much, Peter. Um, we've got a few questions coming in the chat, but there's still time to drop more questions in. I guess I might just ask our panellists uh, a few questions first, take the, take the moderator's privilege. Now, Peter, you talked about the four options put up for the general purpose uh, frigate, obviously uh, a decision we're not going to see for 12 months. But you also talked about the fact that if you look at those frigates uh, that are on offer, really there's only kind of one that you could put forward without having to significantly modify it for uh, not only our environment, but also the weapon systems we use, combat systems, et cetera. Do you mind giving a little bit more of an overview of the uh, four frigates that are up for contention? Yeah, sure thing. In fact, um, I, just in case you were going to uh, ask that one, I've actually got a slide on each, um, which I'll share. Um, Thank you. Great minds think alike. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, so the Miko is the one that, that uses the Miko Flex system for modular uh, fitting a system. So that one seems to be uh, that's the Egyptian version, but so you've got a little bit more wriggle room potentially, depending on how the government looks in terms of being able to slip uh, Australian systems in into it. Um, it's in service with a couple of um, navies, South Africa um, and, uh, and Egypt being two of them. So that's that one. It's one of the, the largest ones. It's got the longest range of, of them. Um, 
And um, the, the next one is the Megami. Uh, it's uh, interesting in terms of a small uh, complement. Uh, I guess the, the caution looking at these four is when you look at the complement, sometimes they talk about just how many bunks they have, not so much on how many people does it take to actually operate it. The, the challenge for this uh, ship is, depending on how you say you don't want to modify it, is it has a Japanese surface-to-air missile and it has a Japanese surface-to-air surface missile. The surface-to-air missile will be using a Mark 41 vertical launch system, but do, do you really want to have a, um, a Japanese surface-to-air missile? And uh, my experience is on operations, you actually are going to an American um, logistics system to get uh, replacement ammunition. So, you know, so that raises a problem to, to be able to have this ship. You, if you don't want to modify it, you probably have to modify your replenishment ships to be able to um, support this ship. So um, that's just a, a challenge with the uh, with the Mogami. Um, on a uh, the um, the report talks about the Daegu batch two and three. In fact, just to be accurate, the Daegu is a, is the Korean batch two. The Chung Nam is the batch three of the same design. As uh, you can see from that slide, the batch three essentially has phased array. Um, once again, like the Megami, it has an indigenous surface to air missile system, and it has an indigenous anti ship missile system. Also, it has a hangar for a smaller helicopter. So if you wanted to, do you really want to get another helicopter type into the fleet air arm? Don't think so. So you'd have to um, be able to either modify the handling system or at the very least, you're going to have to modify the internals of the hangar to be able to, uh, to take all the sp spares and support for a, um, a Seahawk. Um, and finally, the Navantia. Navantia is the only one that um, it's the smallest. Um, it has a high degree of commonality, except for the close-in weapon system, is uh, is the Spanish one, not the Phalanx Seawiz, and um, and also it's the only one not in service. So once again, it's that um, it's not a mature in-service design. So that's the the four, Jen. Great. Thanks so much, Peter. Fantastic overview. I might um, turn to some of the questions in the chat now um, and no particular order, but there is one directly related to your presentation, uh, Peter, so I'll give it to you. So from Marcus Hellier, good to see you online, Marcus. Uh, are the four designs an actual shortlist or are they simply illustrated exemplars? Richard Miles has taken both positions. If the former, what engagement with industry was it based on? If the latter, are we still going to develop a shortlist? Now, this might be a little bit of a difficult one uh, to, to touch on. My understanding was that it was a short list. Peter, did you have any comments on that question? Um, uh, hello, Marcus. Uh, my read of it was a short list and my purely on the basis that they were saying they're going to try and make a decision, you know, within 12 months or so. So that's what I I thought was my, my read of it. It was a short list, but I, I'm open to, to be... Um, uh, to, to be contradicted, but um, and you know, as as you well know, Marx, um, that twelve months will get eaten up very quickly. Uh, Sarah, I saw you nodding uh, during that. Did you want to offer some some commentary on that? You're on mute. Yes, I saw that. Um, yes, I do think that it's a short list um, because of the manner in which it was explicitly laid out in the outcomes of the Enhanced Lethality Service Combatant Fleet Review. I think the other important point to note is that, um, you know, where the, the information that we have to hand publicly is only through the ministerial statements, press releases and Q&As and what's actually in um, the the outcomes document. So, you know, the, the detail of the considerations and there are some other questions that touch on um, the considerations of the reviewer reviewers. We won't know that, I believe, um, anytime in the near future because that is clearly being very close held by both Navy and government. 
Thanks, Sarah. Um, Richard, uh, one for you and then and the other panellists can jump in. Uh, from uh, Malcolm Davis. Malcolm, great to see you online. Uh, he says, a famous naval analyst, I think it was one, uh, a female one with blonde hair, potentially, who's not that famous, uh, once said, uh, you can't get destroyers from Amazon on international, uh, on national TV. Uh, but realistically, how quickly could we get capabilities if we had to surge against a looming crisis? So Richard, I'll get you to touch on that. And then um, Peter and Sarah, I'm sure you'll have some commentary on that as well. Um, I think the answer, well, a lot depends on the crisis, really. Um, uh, because domestically, I think the answer is not very quickly. Um, and so you're immediately then going to have to look overseas. Um, and that is going to be a challenge, particularly because most, well, a lot of the crises that we are vaguely talking about, although not necessarily always explicitly, um, are the kind of crises where other people will be desperately trying to hang on to their own um, domestic industrial production. Um, so you cannot necessarily go to South Korea or Japan or one of the other major shipbuilders and say, um, we want to buy a load of stuff um, off the shelf, because if the balloon really goes up in, in Asia, they're going to be very much looking at, at their own um, uh, domestic requirements. So it, it is a, a real challenge, um, and it is one of the potential benefits of, of getting um, greater domestic industry. Um, but as always with these sorts of things, we talk a lot about sovereign industry. We talk a lot less about what actually sovereign industry means um, once you start getting into supply chains and everything else. Um, just bolting it together in Australia is not really a sovereign industry in that kind of a, a, a sense. Um, so I think we always need to be a bit careful about playing around with those terms. No, thanks, Richard. And I guess, you know, one of the, one of the key takeaways, although the uh, surface combatant fleet review talked about lethality and enhancement, and overall it's a, it's a good win for the number of service platforms, you know, one of the key elements, I think this goes to the heart of Malcolm's question, is there is a significant period of vulnerability where we actually take a reduction in service combatant uh, until the end of the 20s and we start to build up. Um, Peter, Sarah, is there anything you'd like to offer on that before we go to another question? I have, a, I have two points, if that's okay, Jan. So one, one relates to the short-term, long-term tension. Um, so I'll start with that. Um, and then the other is regarding the concept of sovereign industrial capability, which I've got a lot to say about, and I won't be able to express all my thoughts in this webinar and the time frame, but I will make a couple of key points. So in terms of that tension, I think one of the great challenges um, that DSR actually raises and is then evident in the outcomes um, with respect to the surface combatant challenge specifically is this short-term, long-term tension. So governments put on the agenda nation-building efforts around the construction of nuclear-powered submarines in Australia, um, new surface combatant um, build programs, uh, and a very ambitious shipbuilding schedule, which I wholeheartedly endorse. I think actually you know, as an ex-naval officer, it's a very exciting future that we have. However, there's a real tension between that long-term nation-building agenda and what we might need to do if we're in um, some sort of crisis in the next couple of years. So the, the difference in the type of industrial-based mobilisation that might be required to meet um, or to strengthen national resilience um, may in some ways be at odds with that broader shipbuilding agenda. So resolving these, that gap um, is, is going to be very challenging um, across the whole defence sector, I believe. And that's happening in light where there's um, certainly from the small to medium enterprise base, a loss in confidence about whether government's really committed to enabling um, thriving defence sector businesses in this country. There are many businesses that have faced cancellation after cancellation in the last two years. And the Minister for Defence and Deputy Prime Minister um, at an industry roundtable the day after the Service Combatant Fleet Review outcomes were announced, told industry there are further cuts to come. What they are, we might not find out until the made budget or the integrated investment plan, but this is causing real concern for that small to medium enterprise um, across the sector, including um, businesses that feed the um, maritime supply chain, and many are actually exiting. So in this short-term period, 
Um, industry is not like a tap that you can turn on and off that, you know, if you turn it off and you leave it too long, when you turn it back on again or turn the funding back on or the flow of purchase orders, it's not going to be flowing at the same rate. And so I think there's a real tension here that needs to be addressed. And I think that that um, reduction in confidence from uh, SMEs has been enhanced very recently by the sovereign po um, industry policy settings that have been released from the Defence Industrial Development Strategy. As I said, I actually think it's a vote of no confidence in Australian industry because it's actually laid out that in order to be a, um, to, to fulfil the sovereign industrial capability de definition, you need capability that could contribute to the defence defense and that you have an ABN. Now, as I think it was Marcus Hellier um, and maybe um, um, the grumpy strategist pointed out, um, you could be um, Huawei and meet that requirement. So I think it's really diluted the um, the th that definition. And the consequence of that is that we will see a lack of investment, I believe, in Australian SMEs to get them to the necessary level. But it's also outsourced a lot of our thinking to firstly our AUKUS partners and then the broader global industrial base. And um, to Richard's earlier point, you know, in a time of crisis, we might not actually be able to rely on that industrial base to prioritise Australia's national interest. So I'll leave it there. As I said, I've got a lot more to say, but um, it might cover some of the questions that have arisen in the chat as well. Oh, the mute button. Uh, thanks so much, Sarah. Peter, would you like to offer any remarks before we go to another question? Just very quickly, if the uh, if the crisis um, was not open ocean, uh, I'd be talking to Austal and Incat. What can they do? Um, is clearly design and uh, and you know it, it's it may not be a forever solution, but they they seem to be um, quite capable of being able to deliver aluminium-based ships relatively uh, quickly. Great, thanks, Peter. Uh, look, uh, lots of questions. Um, I guess there's there's a few that relate to uh, concept. So. Uh, Richard, you talked on uh, the distributed uh, maritime operations concept. There's a question around that. Um, there's one here from uh, Matt Houston that says, does the narrative of the surface combatant review lack sufficient connectivity to current defence strategy and maritime strategy concepts such that there is a clear understanding of what the Navy's role is? If so, is there a risk that further reset will be required in the near future as an example? Is there adequate narrative to demonstrate the role in deterrence and denial? Consequently, is there a risk that capability selection Corvette is incorrect? Uh, simple question, what are these Corvettes intended to do? So, so I guess um, a really good point. I think those that have, have read anything I've written would probably know my, my views on this. Do we think that there is a, a consistent, na consistent narrative from the DSR through, you know, I guess our, our maritime doctrine, which is, which is quite dated, to justifying uh, this strategy of how we're going to employ these assets? Uh, and do we think there's further work there to deal around concepts? Uh, Richard, I might uh, go to you, and then I think uh, the whole panel will probably have a view on this, so we'll go through the whole panel. Um, yes, thank you for the questions. Um, I think it's a really interesting set of questions. Um, I suspect that there is a relatively coherent set of ideas currently inside defense around this. Um, obviously, it's very, very difficult for us from the outside to, to really see what's going on. Um, but I think you can make a quite a clear logical argument around um, a lot of this, this structure coming out of uh, the DSR um, and looking even back further to sort of the strategic framework set out by the DSU and, and flowing sort of through. Um, my question is less whether or not you can make a clear, coherent argument around this. And is more comes back to, to some of the issues, and I think Peter flagged elements of this and, and things, that if you don't make anything like this even relatively explicit, uh, the trouble is that inside defense, things will change. Um, some of these concepts might shift. Um, and the connections between uh, the ideas and the, the, the way we're looking at some of these challenges 
um, and the capabilities you're acquire, acquiring can quite easily, you can develop significant divergences. Um, and I think you see that a lot in these kind of projects, um, particularly if they're longer term. Um, so the, the trouble with not making things at least relatively explicit, um, and I appreciate there are obviously very significant issues with making things very explicit, um, but is that you begin to see this, this kind of divergence between um, the implicit understanding of what it is that you want to do um, and the explicit statement of the capabilities you're acquiring to try and achieve that. Um, so I do think that there is potential for a, a, a clearer, more coherent public facing narrative. Um, and I think some form of, and there's talk about a national need for a national strategy and a maritime strategy. Uh, and I certainly would, would support something along those lines. Although, um, the idea of going through creating further reviews and documents and everything else, I suspect there'll be a fair, fair bit of public eye rolling. Um, but I think there does need to be more public facing clarity um, around some of these, these concepts. And I think it would then help think through some of the challenges um, around workforce and around what it is that the Navy is now set up to do and what it's not set up to do, which I think is some of the other things that, that haven't really been um, sort of brought to the fore. Yes, and I, and I think you're right, Richard. And one of the points you raised earlier about, uh, you know, how this review evolved in terms of only dealing with a, a small subsection of the Navy's fleet, you know, further complicates that. Uh, I'll give a shameless plug. Uh, I did release an ASPE publication talking about a maritime strategy last year. So if you want to have a read. Um, Sarah, I think I'll go to you and then I'll go to, to Peter to offer some, some comments on that. Um, rather than talking about um, CONOPS and this, the, the maritime strategy perspective um, and covering off what Richard just shared, um, I'm fully supportive of the maritime strategy, by the way. I just think that across the country, we have a lot of sea blindness. A lot of, you know, the, the average Australian doesn't really understand why a maritime strategy and why the Navy matters and why it matters that we're actually investing all this money into naval capabilities. You, we, we just haven't got that cut through yet. Um, but I'd actually like to frame my response in the context of supportability. So I think really understanding um, the operating concepts for these vessels, particularly um, this general purpose frigate is going to be really critical. And I say that because um, over the last well, more than a decade now in transitioning the LHDs, the DDGs and the new tankers into service, um, Navy's gone through this process of having to adjust its expectations about employment and um, operational concepts with respect to these vessels baselined against the actual design of the vessel. So um, there's this period into transition into service where you have a um, an idea of what's been acquired, then you start operating it and employing it, building the support system around it. And, and that's when the rubber hits the road and you start to really understand where there are gaps in understanding um, or trade-offs have been made. And, and I think this is going to be particularly challenging with respect to procuring um, a military off-the-shelf design and uh, transitioning it into service. And I suspect we'll see significant investment required in that transition period to get the operating cycle right for the Australian context, um, the system safety and the safety program right for the Australian context. So even if we we're not actually fundamentally changing the design, there are elements that relate to the design of the support system, um, you know, the workforce requirements, et cetera, that will all need to be considered that hang across that fundamental um, con ops and then it's linked back to the DSR and the higher level maritime strategy. Thanks, um, Sarah. But I'll get you to offer some remarks and also if you could offer some thoughts about what you think is the potential risk to this program, which we, we haven't necessarily touched on in detail yet. Okay, thanks, Jen. Yeah, and I've, I've just been looking at the um, very good um, comments in the in the chat room and, and, and some of them have talked about that risk is issue. So I think I've touched on one, which is just commitment. You need that by um, partisan commitment. I think the other one is communications, and we've sort of uh, talked a little bit about that. D defense and uh, and government have got to be able to talk much more clearly in clear English and be proactive about defense issues, but also 
about this program. Um, and I'll just give you a, a, um, a topical example um, the other week, which was where it was reported in the media that the US Navy were only ordering one SSN. No one seemed to, unless I missed it, no one seemed to say, look, the story is that the last five years, the, the, both shipyards have, have struggled. Um, and so the US Navy weren't saying they're not committed to, to submarines a year, but just that because of those workforce shortages and, and supply chain shortages, they just couldn't, uh, th there was pointless ordering another one which wasn't going to be spent. We seem to be, uh, or we as in Australia seem to be incapable of be, just being able to clearly put that out in the media, explain it all and, and stop the hairs running. So I think defence and, and government have got to be much better at talking very clearly about defence issues without waffle. Um, the other one is money um, and workforce. And the government has got to build the economy. It's got to expand the economy so we can afford both this and the nuclear program. But the other one is just workforce. Um, as many of you will, uh, will know, some of these areas that uh, we're wanting to have this activity, it's very hard to have a house, for example. Just try to house and recruit people is, is quite difficult, particularly in WA, um, where there's so many competing demands. So, so it needs to be in as part of a national program of expanding the economy, fixing things like housing, the, all these little long poles in the tent, which are going to just constrain our ability to fund things, but actually to execute these multiple programs. Thanks so much, Peter. Look, we're getting up against time. I'm going to go to uh, one more question. I'm sorry for those that, that we will have missed. Uh, and Peter, I might just ask you to uh, address this one because it's it's um, fairly linked to what you've been talking on. Um, we're lucky enough to have, as you mentioned, a number of former Chiefs of Navy online. We've got a question here from uh, Admiral Noonan. Um, all great points for commonality in service designs. Um, by rough count, we're potentially looking at no less than 12 different classes of surface vessels, three different classes of submarines in 2030, 2040. Crewing, training, operating, and logistically supporting a Navy of such diverse array of platforms would be challenging. What are your thoughts on that, Peter? I know you, you talked about uh, the, the the benefits we would have had if we'd gone on commonality of hulls. So I think and part of it is you've got to look at, um, and uh, I know Jan has talked about this and other people, about different crewing arrangements. Um, so you need to, uh, one end, you need to reduce your crewing burden. And so I think you need to, make tankers auxiliaries and have a, a sea lift command of some sort. So you're looking at, and the point there is, you're looking at a different sort of person who is going to be in those sort of ships. Um, and so you need to do that. You need to look at, uh, like the um, like the Canadians did in the uh, 80s and 90s, they had um, high readiness and low readiness ships with different manning levels. So there's a range of things like that I think we could do. Um, but I think uh, one of the, the disciplines you need to do for commonality is you need to resist the temptation to get the shiniest toy. You need to accept the fact that the, the one that you select may not be the very best, but it's got it's, a, it's got that greater commonality. But it's, um, you know, we're starting from um, um, a couple of squares back from where you want to be. But I think we just need to articulate that as a, a objective and then slowly walk to, towards it because otherwise we'll be talking about this in another 20 or 30 years. Great. Thanks, Peter. Look, I know there's lots more questions there. Apologies, I'm not going to be able to, to, be able to get through them. Um, uh, I guess I'd like to thank uh, all of our attendees for uh, taking your, your lunch time today to, to talk about these really important issues. Uh, and thank our esteemed panellists. It's been wonderful to, to have you on. Um, and also thank our secretary who have teed up the administration of this. So, so thanks very much to everyone. Um, if you're not uh, a member of the Australian Naval Institute, uh, I would ask you to take a look at our website. Um, it's only through the, uh, the membership and our gracious sponsors that we can do things like this. Um, I'd also flag just as a, a shameless plug. Uh, the ANI also has a podcast called The Saltwater Strategist. Uh, the looks at maritime issues. I've put a link in the chat. Uh, and then finally, ticket sales are now open for the ANI's Vernon Parker Oration, taking place in Canberra on the 15th of May. Uh, lucky enough to had, have uh, the head of the National Security College, uh, Rory Medcalf, coming to speak. So please uh, put a link in the chat, um, grab a ticket for that as well. Thanks, everyone.